Hi everyone, immigration attorney Ali Subban here, and I'm here today at the Kimpton Hotel in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm here with Robert Kraft, the president, chairman, and CEO of First Pathway Partners, and president of the board of Invest in the USA. Thanks for being here today, Bob. Well, thanks, Ali. My pleasure. And we're actually in an EB-5 hotel. This, uh, this hotel was funded with EB-5 money from around the world. So, appropriate place to meet. Yes, indeed. And so today we're going to be talking about the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Visa Program. Um, so, for those that don't know, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get started in the EB-5 space, Bob? Well, the short story is I, uh, I've been in business my entire career. I'm not an attorney. I wasn't involved with immigration at all. Uh, but I had a, a software development company that was quite successful in Milwaukee. And uh, I was very involved with the state of Wisconsin on economic development. And some of the initiatives in the inner city to help people get employment. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board of Word of Hope Ministries, which has the uh, prisoner reentry program for the state of Wisconsin. And my, a lot of my time was spent helping people get their lives back together after incarceration, helping them have a little bit of opportunity to get their respect and dignity back and to get back to that community. And I've done that for the last 10 years. I'm still very active in that. And as uh, I participated at the um, Chamber of Commerce on the board level for the, for the Milwaukee metropolitan area uh, in the early 1990s, uh, you could see that China was growing significantly in terms of their economic power. And I suggested to the uh, board that we figure out how to attract capital to Wisconsin from China like in the 80s, Japanese rose economically and made significant investments in the United States. And if Milwaukee didn't put its hand up in the state of Wisconsin in some fashion, the money that was flowing, beginning to flow to the United States, would bypass us, go to the coast. So that was really the beginning of the, the, what led me into EB-5. Uh, I uh, uh, made a number of trips to China to promote Wisconsin with the governors. Uh, and that was really through a lot of the work that I've done in the inner city, just helping people. So the relationships with both the city, uh, congressional members, senators, and the governor, because we did good things to help a lot of people and weren't looking for anything bad. So they, they accompanied me to uh, China uh, to promote Wisconsin state and the state in terms of investment opportunities for those, those folks. And we couldn't get any traction. The problem was nobody had ever heard of Wisconsin in China. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and said, there's got to be a reason to draw money into Wisconsin. And we found EB-5, uh, which was established in 1990 and then modified in 92 when the Regional Center pilot program was established. And we thought that might be a good way to promote investment in Wisconsin. Let's apply for regional center designation, which I did in 2007. And it was at the time I had actually sold the software company, did a year transition to an international company that had management and would take it over. And I said, this EB-5 business is very interesting. I've always done international business. I've spent a lot of time all over the world, and I've always found it interesting, you know, the cultures and the, and the people, the way they do business in different countries and their objectives and where they want to go with their lives. So this, this could be a pretty interesting way to end my career. So we became the 21st regional center designated in the United States in 87, and I began full time. And, uh, but originally it was to drive economic development for the state. Uh, and then it became much more than that. And we, uh, since we started, uh, we've gone from not being known overseas to one of the premier places for investment because of the good lifestyle, the conservative nature, the diverse economy, the wealthiness of the people here, and just the business opportunities in the Midwest. Foxconn is a result of all the seed planting that we did along with the state. That never would have happened if we hadn't for eight years kind of softened the beach up. So we're real proud of what we've done for the state and, and it's a great business and we've done a good job for our investors also. So for those that don't know about, what is the immigrant, EB-5 Immigrant Investor Visa Program? 
So the uh, EB-5 program, uh, as I mentioned, was established law in 1990 and then modified in 92. And it is a, a law that allows people to immigrate to the United States by investing $500,000 at risk, it must be at risk, create 10 American jobs, uh, and then if you do that and think like an American entrepreneur, then you very much want you to come to this country. Because these people are well educated, they're motivated, they're obviously successful already. And that's a way to really take advantage of what is called merit-based immigration. And these people are well vetted. And they're quality people that buy homes, they send their child or children to universities, high schools, and they add to our economy and our richness of life. So EB-5 is monitored uh, uh, by Department of Homeland Security, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, the documentation is pretty extensive, but we have a very good group of attorneys that we work with, like you. They're very knowledgeable in the law and are able to, you know, kind of take the complexity out of it for the investors and gain safe passage to the United States and hopefully uh, gain their dream. Uh, they wouldn't be coming here if they didn't share the American dream that I share and you share. Right. And you said that you had created um, or started a regional center, and there's two types of ways that someone can invest in the EB-5 immigrant investor visa. One is through a direct investment, and the other is through a regional center. So can you tell us a little bit about what is a regional center? Well, a regional center is a designated area that's approved by USCIS. So you submit as an individual or as a nonprofit or as a group uh, an application to be designated a geographic region uh, by UC, USCIS, so they call you a regional center. What that does within that geographic region, within the businesses that you applied for under your application, uh, the minimum investment amount goes from a million dollars, which is the direct program, down to 500000 and we will talk about it later because that, that's going to change probably before the end of the year. Okay. But right now it's $500,000 and it makes it easier to qualify because under the regional center program, you don't have to have just direct jobs. Uh, the government will allow you to account using economic accepted principles, direct, induced, and indirect jobs. So it makes it easier to pool funds, to build hotels or invest in manufacturing companies or hospitals or infrastructure projects. So it, it allowed the program to really take off because the million dollar direct investment limits you to uh, 10 direct jobs that you have to uh, qualify them with W-2s, you know, with payroll stuffs, et cetera. It, 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 and you don't have the benefit to take advantage of the indirect and induced jobs. So it's a bigger hurdle, plus it's double the amount. So the program really wasn't moving very much until the regional center program was introduced. And then in the 2000s, it uh, began to really take off. And now we're over, over subscribed in some of the countries. So for an investor that's looking to invest in a regional center, what are some of the things that they should be looking for? Well, I think they should, and I, and I say this a lot, I, I speak around the world, Probably the most important thing is uh, the history of the regional center. Uh, you know, have they been in the business for a period of time? Because it is a very complex business. Uh, who does the legal work? Uh, the legal best base documents are critically important for an application to successfully move through the complexities of the U.S. government system, USCIS. So if you have the legal right with attorneys that have also uh, practice for a while and understand the law and are, are very good at what they do uh, and you have a regional center that has a track record that you can point to that they have successfully uh, gained 526 approval for uh, applicants, 829 permanent green card and return capital. To me that, that's the gold standard and there are only a handful of regional centers that can make that claim. Not that they're not necessarily good but some of them are newer, so they haven't gotten to the capital return part yet when the project's refinanced. But uh, I would look real hard at the background of the regional center principles and what they've achieved, how many projects have they done, have they been successful, have they had any issues. You know, normal due diligence, but I think it's really important that you take the time to dig in deep. 
And um, the U.S. Congress has approved the EB-5 Immigrant Investor Visa Program through September 30th, 2019. And um, what do you see as any changes um, that are, might be on the table? Well, uh, for the first time in probably five years, uh, I can say with great confidence and optimism that we are going to extend the program for a significant period of time. Up until now, the industry has been uh, at odds with respect to what the legislation should look for. So it's like a, it's been like a food fight in a family, and the parents don't want to make a decision. And so we keep receiving extensions because Congress likes the program. Both, both Republicans and Democrats like it because it's driven significant economic growth in the United States. We've created 365,000 jobs in the last few years just through EB-5. And everybody in the United States would like to see more EB-5 capital flow into their cities and towns. So that's not an issue, but the issue has been a battle between different factions of the industry, some are metropolitan, big city areas, rural areas, they couldn't agree on a new platform to balance out and make the program more fair and not leaning towards certain areas of the country. Uh, last year, uh, over the last year, uh, we have brought the industry together. Uh, I became president of IUSA uh, two and a half years ago, just asked to serve for the third year, uh, which I was pleased to do. And we've spent a lot of time trying to bring those groups together, which we did successfully a year ago. So the industry is now on the same platform with respect to legislation, which is significant, very significant with Congress because they've told us, and I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill now, more than I thought I ever would, and uh, more time in Washington, D.C. than I ever thought I would, and more time with the politicians than I ever thought I would. But, you know, it's 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 good work, so we're, we're trying to drive forward permanent, meaningful legislation that now the whole industry agrees uh, agrees to, and we've been told by our representatives and senators that's fantastic because until you guys all got your act together and we're on the same page, there's no way we we're going to be able to legislate. So we kept punting down the road. So that is a huge change in the industry, which I'm very proud of. And a lot of people in the various factions have worked hard to get to that point. We're hopeful that in September, the regional center program expires on the 30th. Uh, that by the 30th, and we're working on draft legislation right now, we will get a six-year authorization. We will have an interpretation of derivatives, which has been a big issue for the backlog and retrogression. That will be adjusted because the original intent of the law was 10,000 investment units, mm -hmm. not family members. Right. And that's, that's cut the program by 66%. Uh, if you assume there's three members in the family, just on average. So that's really uh, limited our growth. So if they made that simple change, then retrogression would go away and we'd have a big runway. And everybody is in agreement on that, including Congress, because it was a misinterpretation of the original legislation over a period of time when the program wasn't fully utilized. And it just happened. It wasn't intentional. It just they started counting family members, and that, that was not the original of the law. Sure. So we think we're going to get that fixed. Uh, we also are looking at a minimum investment amount that will probably go to 800000 from five hundred, and it will go to 900000 uh, for the uh, direct area. Okay. So there will be a differential of 100000 plus there's some fees in there. But those are the major changes. Um, uh, in six years, it will be a, a, it gives them surety and certainty to the program. And eliminate some of the well. Is it going to, you know, get extended? It's going to get extended. And we keep going on these continuing resolutions. So, so we're 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 hopeful. Uh, there's a faction within the industry that feels like Congress probably won't be able to act on September 30th. Okay. It'll get extended till the end of the year as is. Mm -hmm. But then uh, it'll definitely get passed toward the end. Of then the we're year. looking at some comprehensive yeah. Legis yeah. Le yeah. legislation yeah. coming into effect. Okay. Um, and you had talked a little bit about the, um, the economic development and growth of the EB-5 program. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what other benefits 
uh, the EB-5 program has for the U.S. economy? Well, during that same period where um, 365,000 jobs were created, there was about $35 billion that came in direct to the United States. And in addition to that, that probably drives another $70 billion minimum. So, I mean, it's a big number. It's a really big it's number. It's huge. Yeah, so, and it's, it's, it's been very well utilized. Uh, clearly, hotels have been very popular, but hospitals have been built uh, in Cleveland and in Buffalo, New York, and other cities that need uh, Schools have been built, charter schools. Infrastructure, a turnpike in Pennsylvania was built. Infrastructure in New York City. I mean, it kind of runs the full gamut, and it's been very creatively used in a lot of cities and rural areas. So there's some wind farms out in the Dakotas, um, solar farms. I mean, there's very, very interesting green kind of things. Sure. Um, so it, it kind of runs the full gamut, and it's been good from a job creation standpoint, obviously. But the investors that come in, the other number that's not really counted is the money they invest uh, in their families, buying homes, going to school. They pay taxes. Uh, you know, they become part of the whole American dream and expand our country's fabric with their talents and their various cultures. It's a good thing. It's a, it's American. So it's been it's a really good program. I'm very proud to be associated. So we're here at the Kimpton Hotel um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and this hotel was uh, built with some EB-5 uh, monies. Can you tell us about how did EB-5 um, affect the construction of this hotel? Well, this hotel wouldn't have been built if not for EB-5 money, and uh, it was a significant number. Um, all the applicants uh, have received their 526s uh, and their 829s. Uh, the, the hotel just opened uh, uh, two plus years ago, so it's early in its stage, but it's stabilized, it's performing very well. There'll be a refinancing uh, effort on it in a couple of years for our contract with the investors. And it's been a great addition to the third ward in Milwaukee. Absolutely. So in addition to this, we've been involved with the Marriott Hotel downtown, the Aloft Hotel downtown, the West Dallas Hampton Hotel, all doing very, very well. The Global Water Center, we've done 13 projects. So uh, FPP has been involved with uh, just about $2 billion worth of total economic development between Wisconsin, and we also have authority in Southern California and in Chicago. So uh, we're, we're looking at projects around the country now because our reputation is kind of taking us to other areas saying, well, why don't you guys consider Florida or Texas or whatever? So we're looking at other areas. And, and one of the questions I get asked by immigrant investors sometimes, too, is um, if a project is, say, here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but the immigrant investor wants to live somewhere else, they can they can do that, right, Bob? Yeah, yeah, and that's a great question because that's misunderstood by a lot of people. But they can live, regardless of where they can invest, where they invest, they can live anywhere in the United States. So if someone's looking, uh, there are immigrant investors out there and they're looking to get involved with the regional center, how can they get a hold of you? Well, uh, our website, uh, uh, www.firstpathway.com, and uh, if you uh, Google First Pathway for our natural, come right to us, of course, and uh, we're here, and uh, we have a staff that's pretty much been intact since we started 11 years ago, which I am very proud of, and uh, they've kind of grown in the business and helped build this company, and our uh, affiliates and, and partners like you that are all over the world, and uh, we kind of have relationships for a long time, and that, that kind of goes to the quality of the work of the people in the company we do on behalf of the investors and our legal partners, the accounts that we work with, the builders, the construction companies, the developers, and everybody. You know, it's a very complex business. There are a lot of moving parts to do it right, and uh, we're proud of the uh, fact that we have great relationships with the government as well. Well, thanks for it's been a pleasure, Bob. Thank thanks you. for meeting thank with us. Well, thank you very much.